The Art of Living Consciously The Power of Awareness to Transform Everyday Life By Nathaniel Brandon Part 5 Chapter 14 Authoritarian and Rebel The authoritarian and the rebel are two parts of the personality that many of us have in one form or another. If they are strong voices in us, they can make it difficult to sense and follow our intuition. If we are unconscious of them, they may control our behavior in a way that interferes with our ability to get in touch with our true desires. The battle between them can create tremendous conflict within us, as well. As in dealing with all of our inner selves, the first and most important step is becoming conscious of them. Once we become aware of them, we are already separating from being identified with them. We recognize them as part of us, and we begin to have conscious choice about how much power we give them. We can appreciate them for the ways in which they've tried to help us, and for what they still have to offer us. The inner authoritarian carries our need for order and structure and the rules we have learned about how we should behave. People who grow up in a home with a strong authoritarian parent figure, or in a very authoritarian religion, always develop a powerful inner authoritarian self who carries all the values and rules of the external authority figures. It tries to protect you and keep you safe by making sure that you follow the rules, maintain order, and behave as a good, responsible person. If you have a strong authoritarian self, you usually make one of two choices, you strive to follow its rules or you rebel against them. If you follow them faithfully, you are likely to be a responsible, law-abiding person and oftentimes a high achiever. You may, however, lose touch with your spontaneous, free-spirited, creative energies and eventually, you may even feel that you've lost your soul. Some people react to their authoritarian upbringing and their own internalized authoritarian by developing a strong rebellious self. They become identified with the rebel and disown the authoritarian self, but it remains in the shadow of their unconscious, trying to control their behavior and constantly triggering the rebel into action. The rebel usually develops in childhood or adolescence, in an attempt to maintain a sense of self and find some freedom in an overly oppressive rule structure. This can literally be a lifesaver at the time. Unfortunately, the rebel is just a knee jerk reaction to the authoritarian's rules. It reacts in rebellion to any controlling influence from inside or out. It will automatically do the opposite of whatever it thinks it's supposed to do. Thus, it is really no freer than the authoritarian, it's just the flip side of the same coin. It has little to do with the person's true desires, it just does the opposite of what it's told. Eventually, it becomes a self-sabotaging force, often inclined toward addictive and self-destructive behavior. Many people who identify with the rebel were the black sheep of their families, acting out the disowned energies of the other family members. They may continue this pattern in later life, always becoming the scapegoat or shadow carrier in every relationship. The rebel will fight against any energy it fears will control it, including legitimate authority figures, or your own internal attempts to create positive structure in your life. For example, your boss might make a reasonable request, and you become angry and resist doing what she asks, you decide to eat a healthier diet and your rebel immediately eats three pieces of chocolate cake, you decide to exercise in the morning and you find you've slept until noon. As always, when we are overly identified with an energy, we attract its opposite in our relationships. If you are identified with your authoritarian voice, you will probably have a rebellious mate, rebellious children, and or rebellious employees. If you are identified with the rebel, you will constantly attract authoritarian energies into your life, the police, the IRS, your mate, your boss, etc. Whether we become overly identified with the authoritarian or with the rebel, these identifications are unconscious, so there is no real choice or freedom. When your authoritarian self is dictating your every move, or is constantly battling with your rebel, it is almost impossible to get in touch with your intuitive feelings or true desires. The key then is to become aware of, and learn to recognize, both of these energies. 
Try to notice when one or the other takes over, or when they are locked in conflict. Once you become aware of them, acknowledge them for trying to help and protect you. Then see if you can drop in a little deeper to intuitively sense what it is that you really need and want in this situation. A client of mine was frustrated with her career and saw that she was bringing about her firing. She was working in an office, doing administrative work for a salesperson. Although she had great organizational abilities, she found herself forgetting to do things. Her boss would come to her and remind her of what hadn't been done and she would fume with anger. She realized she was getting angry any time her boss told her to do something, however reasonable. She felt she could not afford to lose the job, but she did not want to stay there either. She felt trapped. As we talked, she started to identify the rebel side of herself. She saw she was fighting with the authoritarian, who said she had to stay at that job, and against her boss, who was in a controlling position. She went back to her childhood and examined when she first developed a rebel inside. She saw that she'd had trouble with authorities at other jobs and in school. She realized she was being triggered by old patterns. When she saw this, she immediately wanted to change these parts of herself. I explained to her that she could not force change. If she tried to change or fix her rebel, she'd be activating it, and the rebel would continue to fight. She needed to become willing to watch herself react, to accept that this was the pattern she was acting out. Once she had really grasped what I was saying to her, I asked her to close her eyes and drop into a deeper place inside her self. She needed to ask her intuition what she really wanted. It turned out she wanted to be a saleswoman, but was afraid to try. She was growing angry at herself for sitting behind a desk when she knew there was something else she was meant to do. After realizing what she wanted to do, she was able to come up with several steps she could take to support her goal. She decided to keep her job for the interim and enlist her boss's help in her goal. She decided to conduct several informational interviews at sales companies to get ideas of places she might want to work. Having seen clearly what she wanted and discussed the action she could take to help herself, she felt much better. A month later she called me and said that although her authoritarian and rebel continue to fight it out, they seemed to have less power. She had continued to support her goal to do sales work and was feeling much better about her life and less reactive to her boss. Exercise Identify some of your rules and behaviors that feel demanding and controlling, overly authoritarian, to you. Use the categories below, in addition to any of your own. I have given some examples in each category. Work, I must work 40 to 60 hours per week, I must work hard to get anywhere, I can't make money doing what I want. Money, I'm never going to have enough money, I must save money in case something happens, I must not be frivolous with money. Relationships, I have to find a mate, I must please my mate, I have to be monogamous, I'd better be satisfied with what I've got. Sex, I have to have an orgasm every time I have sex, I have to be in love with someone to have sex, I have to be the greatest, most sensual lover. Now write down any corresponding rebel thoughts you may have. For example, who needs work, I'm going to quit my job, or who cares about money anyway, I don't need it, or I'll just do what I want behind my mate's back. After you've written out the authoritarian and rebel dialogues, drop into a deeper place and ask yourself what you most want, discover what is true for you. Write down any thoughts or feelings that come to you. Chapter 15 Relationships Relationships in the old world have often had a primarily external focus, we try to make ourselves whole and happy by getting something from outside ourselves. Inevitably, this expectation results in disappointment, resentment, and frustration. Either these feelings build up constantly and cause continual strife, or they are suppressed and lead to emotional numbness. Still, we cling to relationships out of emotional insecurity, or go from one to another searching for that missing piece that we haven't yet found. 
We've been in this tragic predicament for at least a few thousand years, now we seem to be approaching a crisis point. Relationships and families as we've known them seem to be falling apart at a rapid rate. Many people are panicky about this, some try to re-establish the old traditions and value systems in order to cling to a feeling of order and stability in their lives. It's useless to try to go backward, however, because our consciousness has already evolved beyond the level where we were willing to make the sacrifices necessary to live that way. In the past, many people were willing to hang on to an essentially dead relationship for an entire lifetime because it gave them physical and emotional stability. Now, more and more of us are realizing that it is possible to have deeper intimacy and ongoing aliveness and passion in a relationship. We're willing to let go of old ideas about relationship in order to search for these ideals, but we don't know where to find them. Many of us are still looking outside ourselves, sure that if we just find the right man or woman to be with, we'll be blissfully happy, or thinking that if only our kids or our parents would behave the right way, then we'd be fine. We're confused and frustrated, our relationships seem to be in chaos, and we don't have the old traditions to lean on or anything new to take their place. Yet, we can't go back, we must move forward into the unknown to create new kinds of relationship. In order to do this, it's important to understand that our external relationships reflect our internal relationships with ourselves. My primary relationship is my relationship with myself, all others are mirrors of it. As I learn to love myself, I automatically receive the love and appreciation that I desire from others. If I am committed to myself and to living my truth, I will attract others with equal commitment. My willingness to be intimate with my own deep feelings creates the space for intimacy with another. Enjoying my own company allows me to have fun with whomever I'm with. And feeling the aliveness and power of the universe flowing through me creates a life of passionate feeling and fulfillment that I share with anyone I'm involved with. Taking care of ourselves. Because many of us have never really learned how to take good care of ourselves, our relationships have been based on trying to get someone else to take care of us. As babies, we are very aware and intuitive. From the time we are born, we perceive our parents' emotional pain and neediness, and immediately begin to develop the habit of trying to please them and fulfill their needs so that they will continue to take care of us. Later on, our relationships continue along the same lines. There is an unconscious telepathic agreement, I'll try to do what you want me to do and be the person you want me to be if you will be there for me, give me what I need, and not leave me. This system doesn't work very well. Other people are seldom able to fulfill our needs consistently or successfully, so we get disappointed and frustrated. Then, we either try to change the other people to better suit our needs, which never works, or we resign ourselves to accept less than we really want. Furthermore, when we're trying to give other people what they want, we almost invariably do things we don't really want to do and end up resenting them, either consciously or unconsciously. At this point, we may realize that it doesn't work to try to take care of ourselves by taking care of others. I'm the only one who can actually take good care of me, so I might as well do it directly and allow others to do the same thing for themselves. This doesn't mean we can't care for and give to others, it just means that we make a conscious choice to give or not, based on what we truly feel rather than out of fear or obligation. In fact, the better we take care of ourselves, the more we have to give. What does it mean to take care of yourself? For me, it means trusting and following my intuition. It means taking time to listen to all my feelings, including the feelings of the child within me that is sometimes hurt or scared, and responding with care, love, and appropriate action. It means putting my most important inner needs first and trusting that as I do this, everyone else's needs will get taken care of, and everything that needs to be done will get handled. For example, if I'm feeling sad, I might crawl into bed and cry, taking time to be very loving and nurturing to myself. Or I might find someone caring to talk to until some of the feelings are released and I feel lighter. If I've been working too hard, 
I'm learning to put the work aside no matter how important it seems, and take some time to play, or just to take a hot bath and read a novel. If someone I love wants something from me that I truly don't want to give, I'm learning to say no as clearly and lovingly as possible, and trust that he or she will actually be better off than if I did it when I didn't want to. This way, when I say yes, I really mean it. There is a very important point I want to make here, it concerns something I was confused about for a long time and finally understood. Taking care of yourself does not mean doing it all alone. Creating a good relationship with yourself is not done in a vacuum, without relationship to other people. If it were, we could all become hermits for a few years until we had a perfect relationship with ourselves, and then just emerge and suddenly have perfect relationships with others. It is important that we are able to be alone, of course, and some people do need to withdraw from outside relationships to a certain degree, until they feel really comfortable with themselves. Sooner or later, though, we need the reflection that a relationship offers us. We need to build and strengthen our relationship with ourselves in the world of form through interaction with other people. The difference in these approaches is the focus. In the old world of relationships, the focus was on the other person and on the relationship itself. We communicated for the purpose of trying to get the other person to understand us and give us more of what we needed. In new world relationships, the focus is on building our relationship with ourselves and the universe. We communicate to keep our channel clear and to give ourselves more of what we need. The words we speak may even be the same, but the energy is different, and so is the result. For example, suppose I'm feeling lonely and want my partner to spend the evening with me although I know that he is planning to do something else. Previously, I might have been afraid to ask for what I wanted directly. I probably would have stayed home alone and focused on learning to enjoy being alone. Later when I talked with him, I would feel some resentment, though I wouldn't admit it either to myself or him. Nevertheless, he would feel this resentment and become guilty and resentful toward me. None of this would come out in the open until later when we were having an argument and I might say, well you don't care about my feelings anyway, you never want to be with me. At this point, I'm communicating to him, telepathically, my underlying feeling that he is responsible for my happiness. Now, hopefully, I would be more direct from the beginning. I'd say, I know you have other plans, but I'm feeling a need for connection right now and I would love it if you would spend the evening with me. I'm taking responsibility for asking for what I want, and in doing so, I'm actually taking care of myself even though I'm asking for something from him. The key here is that my focus is on myself, this is what I'm feeling and this is what I want. I have to be willing to make myself vulnerable to do this. But I have found that it is the willingness to say what I feel and want that makes me feel whole. In a sense, I'm already feeling more fulfilled because I was willing to back myself up. Everything is out in the open, and he's free to respond honestly. Hopefully, he will check inside to find out what's true for him. If he wants to fulfill my request, that's icing on the cake. If he doesn't, I may feel sad or hurt. I'll communicate my feelings, again, I'm doing it for my own sake, to keep myself clear, and then let go. I'll use that evening as a time to go deeper within myself and strengthen my connection with the universe. I've found a very interesting thing. When I communicate truth, fully and directly, in a non-blaming, non-judgmental way, and say everything I really want to say, it doesn't seem to matter so much how the other person responds. They may not do exactly what I want, but I feel so clear and empowered from taking care of myself that it's easier to let go of the result. If I keep being honest and vulnerable with my feelings to my partner, family, and friend, I won't end up with hidden needs or resentment. When you take care of yourself this way, more often than not, you do get what you ask for. If not, the next step is to let go. Go inside yourself and tune into what your intuition is telling you to do next. Always let it take you to a deeper connection with yourself and the universe. Thus, 
An important part of creating a loving relationship with yourself is to acknowledge your needs and to learn to ask for what you want. We're afraid to do this because we're afraid to appear too needy. It's the hidden, unacknowledged needs, however, that cause us to seem too needy. They aren't coming out directly so they come out indirectly or telepathically. People feel them and back away from us because they intuitively know they can't help us if we aren't acknowledging our need for help. It's paradoxical that as we recognize and acknowledge our own needs and ask for help directly, we are actually becoming stronger. It's the male within supporting the female. People find it easy to give to us, and we feel more and more whole. Following energy. I have found that when I'm willing to trust and follow my energy, it leads me into relationships with the people from whom I have the most to learn. The stronger the attraction, or reaction, the stronger the mirror. So, the energy will always lead me to the most intense learning situation. It can be frightening at first to try to live this way. We have always been terrified to trust our own feelings, especially in the realm of relationships and sexuality. Because this energy is so intense, so changeable and unpredictable, we fear that utter chaos will reign. We're terrified of being hurt or hurting someone else. We don't trust that the universe knows what it's doing, or else we don't trust ourselves to be able to accurately follow our inner guidance. And there's good reason for this. In the area of relationships, we have so many old patterns and addictions that it is often difficult to accurately hear our intuitive inner voice. Following your energy does not mean acting out every impulse, feeling, or fantasy that you have, that would be the road to chaos. In order to follow your energy constructively, it's important to be aware of the various selves or voices within you, which may at times have conflicting feelings and needs. Through this kind of awareness, you can begin to sense the deeper intuitive feeling of where the life force is trying to take you, while honoring important agreements, boundaries, and commitments you may have with others. Until now, most of us have avoided dealing with our fears by constructing stringent rule structures for all our relationships. Every relationship is fitted into a certain category, and each category has a list of rules and appropriate behaviors attached to it. This person is a friend, therefore I behave this way, this person is my husband, therefore he is supposed to do these things, this per son is in my family, so this is how we act with each other, and so on. There's very little space left to discover the truth of each relationship. Some people rebel against these rule systems and purposely create relationships that go counter to our established cultural norms, sometimes this is the case with non-monogamous relationships, homosexual and bisexual relationships, and so on. If motivated mainly by rebellion, these relationships may be largely reactions against the rules, and still may not involve a true attunement to our real needs. Just as every being is a unique entity, Unlike anyone else, every connection between two or more beings is also unique. No relationship is exactly like any other. Furthermore, the nature of the universe is constant change. People change all the time and so do relationships. So when we try too hard to label and control relationships, we destroy them. Then, we spend a lot of time and energy fruitlessly trying to bring them to life again. We must be willing to let our relationships reveal themselves to us. If we tune into ourselves, trust ourselves, and express ourselves fully and honestly with each other, the relationship will unfold in its own unique and fascinating way. Each relationship is an amazing adventure, you never know exactly where it will lead. It keeps changing its mood, flavor, and form from minute to minute, day by day, year to year. At times, it may take you closer to one another. At other times, it may take you farther apart. Commitment and Intimacy When we discuss the idea of trusting and following our energy, people often ask where the concept of commitment fits into this picture. Because we have been so focused on externals, most of us have attempted to make a commitment to an external relationship. What we are really committing to is a certain set of rules. I agree to behave in such and such a manner so that we can feel secure about this relationship. 
Usually these rules are not spelled out clearly, they are assumed. People say they are in a committed relationship but seldom clarify to themselves, or each other, what exactly they are committed to doing or not doing. Generally, in a romantic relationship, one assumption is that the partners are agreeing not to have sex with anyone else. Even that is rather vague, though, as no one defines what having sex is. Often the implied agreement is not to feel sexual attraction toward anyone else. Yet, how can you make an agreement not to feel something? Feelings aren't under our conscious control. We can make commitments about how we will behave, since we do have conscious control of our actions. Most people find that a commitment to monogamous behavior is a necessity in order to preserve the sense of intimacy they desire in a primary relationship. The important question is, do we make that commitment as a way of controlling our partner, I'll be monogamous so you will have to be, too, or from our own integrity, I choose to be monogamous because I want the depth of intimacy that it will create in my primary relationship. The real problem with many of the commitments we make or assume is that they don't allow room for the inevitable changes and growth of people and relationships. If you promise to behave by a certain set of rules that come from outside of you, eventually you are going to have to choose between being true to yourself and being true to those rules. When you stop being honest and real, there's not much left of you to be in the relationship. You end up with an empty shell, a nice commitment, but no real people in it. Because this type of commitment attempts to keep the form of the relationship from changing, more often than not, it simply doesn't last. The fact is that relationships do change form and no commitment can guarantee that they won't. No external form can give us the security that we seek. You could be married for 50 years and the 51st year your spouse could decide to leave you. If we only realize this, it can save us so much pain. People who divorce almost inevitably feel that they have failed, because they assume all marriages should last forever. In many cases, however, the marriage has actually been a success, it's helped each person to grow to the point where they no longer need the same form. What causes the pain in many cases is that we don't know how to allow the form to change while still honoring the underlying love and connection. When you are deeply involved with another human being, the soul connection often lasts forever. The intensity of energy in the relationship, however, increases or decreases in accordance with how much there is to be learned from it at any given time. When you've learned a great deal from being with someone, the energy between you may eventually diminish to the point where you no longer need to interact on a personality level as much or at all. Sometimes, the energy renews itself again later on another level. We don't understand this, so we feel guilty, disappointed, and hurt when our relationships change form. We don't really know how to share our feelings effectively with each other, and so we often respond to these feelings by cutting off our connection with the other person. This causes us real pain, because we are actually cutting off our own deep feelings. I have found that changes in relationships can be less painful, and at times even beautiful, when we can communicate honestly and trust ourselves in the process. Most people believe that sacrifice and compromise are necessary in order to preserve a relationship. The need to sacrifice and compromise is based on a misunderstanding of the nature of the universe. We fear that there is not enough love for us and that the truth may be hurtful. In fact, the universe is filled with love, and the truth, when we can see it, is always healing. When I'm willing to be honest and ask for what I want, to continue sharing my feelings openly, I find that the underlying truth in any situation is the same for all concerned. At first it may seem that I want one thing and the other person wants something else. If we both keep telling the truth as we feel it, sooner or later it works out so that we both see that we can have what we truly want. For example, a couple who are clients of mine were experiencing a great deal of conflict about their work. They were partners is a very successful business. She was tired of the business and wanted to do something else. He loved the work and wanted to continue but did not want to do it without her. They fought constantly about whether to sell the business, her desire, or continue and expand it, his desire. 
once they began to communicate on a deeper level, they uncovered their fears. She yearned to express herself creatively in new ways, but was terrified that she would not be able to successfully step out on her own without his constant support. She was also afraid that she would not be able to make as much money, and he would feel resentful about her diminished contribution to the family income. He was afraid that he would be unable to handle the business successfully without her, he depended heavily on her creative input and did not trust his own intuitive capacity. Also, he feared that his working life would be dull and drab without her warmth and humor. Having expressed their feelings fully, they were able to see that they were both at the point of making a leap into a new level of independence and creativity. They were ready to let go of some of their dependency on one another and develop more trust in themselves. She gradually withdrew from the business and started a new and very different career, which she ultimately found very exciting and rewarding. He continued to run the business and developed it in new and interesting directions. Their relationship was enhanced by their increased independence and self-confidence. For me, commitment in relationship needs to be based on a commitment to myself, to love, honor, obey, and cherish my own being. My commitment in relationship is to respect my own truth and do my best to honor the other person's truth as well. To anyone I love, I promise to do the best I can to be honest, to share my feelings, to take responsibility for myself, to honor the connection I feel with that person, and to maintain that connection. While we may have a strong desire and intention to maintain a certain form of relationship, a marriage for example, we can't have any absolute guarantees about a relationship's form. Real commitment allows for the fact that form is constantly changing, and that we can trust that process of change. It opens the door to the true intimacy that is created when people share deeply and honestly with one another. If two people stay together on this basis, it's because they really want to be together. They continue to find an intensity of love and learning with each other as they change and grow. Monogamy or not? People often ask me if I think monogamy is necessary in a primary relationship. I usually answer by sharing my own experience. As I mentioned earlier in this book, at one time in my life I experimented with non-monogamous romantic relationships. I found that while I had wonderful ideals of love and freedom, emotionally, it was way too painful for me. I also realized that one of my underlying motivations was my fear and ambivalence about commitment in relationship. Once I learned about the many different selves within me, I realized that some of my inner selves are monogamous and some aren't. In fact, I found this to be fairly universal. We all have certain selves who would love to be free to relate sexually to others spontaneously, whenever they feel like it. We have other selves who need and desire the security and exclusivity of a monogamous relationship. The vulnerable child within us, in particular, will not really open up in a non-monogamous relationship. Since showing our deep vulnerability to another is a key to intimacy, if the vulnerable child is not present in a relationship, we will not experience the depth of closeness most of us yearn for in sexual partnership. That level of intimacy is very important to me, so I came to the understanding that for me, a mutual commitment to monogamous behavior is an important element in my relationship with my partner. We understand that attractions to others are an inevitable part of being alive. We can feel and even enjoy those attractions while maintaining appropriate boundaries. If we are honest with ourselves and each other, these experiences can be part of our personal growth and the growth of our relationship. Romance When we meet someone who is a particularly strong mirror for us, we feel an intense attraction, or we may experience it initially as a repulsion or dislike, either way, there's a strong feeling. If that person is of the sex we prefer and has certain characteristics, we may experience the feeling as a sexual attraction. When the energy is particularly strong we have an experience we call, falling in love. Falling in love is actually a powerful experience of feeling the universe move through you. The other person has become a channel for you, a catalyst that triggers you to open up to the love, beauty, and passion within you. 
Your own channel opens wide, the universal energy comes through, and you have a blissful moment of enlightenment, very similar to the experiences some people have after long periods of meditation. This is the most thrilling and passionate experience in the world and, of course, we want to hold on to it. Unfortunately, we don't realize that we are experiencing the universe within ourselves. We recognize that the other person has triggered this experience and we think it is him or her that is so wonderful. At the moment of falling in love, we are accurately perceiving the beauty of that person's spirit, but we may not recognize it as a mirror of our own. We just know that we feel this great feeling when we're with them. So, we often begin to give our power away to them, and start to put our source of happiness outside of ourselves. The other person immediately becomes an object, something we want to possess and hold on to. The relationship becomes an addiction, as with a drug, we want more and more of the thing that gets us high. The problem is that we get addicted to the per son's form, not recognizing that it's the energy we want. We focus on the personality and the body, and try to grab onto it, to keep it. The minute we do this, the energy gets blocked. By grabbing hold of the channel so tightly we are actually strangling it and closing off the very energy we seek. True passion brings us together but our neediness often takes over shortly thereafter. The relationship starts to die almost as soon as it blooms. Then we really panic and usually hold on even tighter. The initial experience of falling in love was so powerful that we sometimes spend years trying to recreate it, but often, the more we try, the more it eludes us. It's only when we give up and let go that the energy may start to flow again and we can experience that same feeling. Such is the tragic nature of romance in the old world. We've spent thousands of years trying to work this one out. Our favorite songs, stories, and dramas reflect and reinforce the externally addicted nature of our relationships and the resulting pain and frustration. In the new world, we are discovering something simple and beautiful that can heal much of our pain, the greatest romance of all can be our love affair with life. A love affair. I am finding that being alive is a love affair with the universe. I also think of it as a love affair between my inner male and female, and between my form and my spirit. As I build and open my channel, more and more energy flows through. I feel greater intensity of feeling and passion. Being in love is a state of being that is independent of any one person. Certain people, however, seem to intensify or deepen my experience of the life force within me. I know that those people are mirrors to me and that they are also channels for special energy in my life. I move toward them because I want the intensification that I experience with them. I feel the universe moving through me to them, and moving through them to me. This could happen through any form of exchange. The energy itself lets me know what is needed and appropriate. It's a mutually satisfying and fulfilling exchange because the universe is giving each of us what we need. It may be a brief, one-time experience, a glance or a short conversation with a stranger. Or, it may be an ongoing contact, a profound relationship that lasts for many years. I see it more and more as the universe coming to me constantly, through many different channels. What I have just written is an ideal scene. I certainly am not living it fully at every moment. Many times I am caught up in my fears and insecurities. However, I am experiencing it more and more frequently, and when I do, it feels wonderful. Exercises 1. Take yourself on a romantic date. Do everything as if you were going out with the most loving and exciting partner you can imagine. Take a luxurious hot bath, dress in your best clothes, buy yourself flowers, go to a lovely restaurant, take a moonlight stroll, do anything else that strikes your fancy. Spend the evening telling yourself how wonderful you are, how much you love yourself, and anything else that you would like your hear from a lover. Imagine that the universe is your lover and is giving you everything that you want. 2. The next time that you feel a romantic or a sexual charge with someone, remember that it's the universe you are feeling. Whatever you do, whether you act on it or not, 
just remember that it's all part of your true love affair with life. Chapter 16 Our Children Living as a channel for the universe applies to parenting as much as to every other area of our lives. While I don't have children myself, I have a number of friends who are using these principles in relating to their children. It certainly isn't easy to transform our old concepts and patterns of raising children, but the results are wonderful to see, bright light radiating from these children, satisfaction and fulfillment for their parents, and the depth of closeness and sharing between them. Our old ideas of parenting usually involve feeling totally responsible for the welfare of our children and trying to follow some behavior standard to be a good parent. As you learn to trust yourself and be yourself spontaneously, you may find yourself violating many of your old rules about what a good parent does. Nevertheless, the energy and aliveness that is coming through you, your increasing sense of satisfaction in your life, and your trust in yourself and the universe, will do far more to help your child than anything else possibly could. In a sense, you don't have to raise your children at all. The universe is the true parent to your children, you are simply the channel. The more you are able to follow your energy and do what is best for you, the more the universe will come through you to everyone around you. As you thrive, your children will, too. When babies are born, they are powerful, intuitive beings. Newly arrived in the physical world, they spend their first years learning to live in a body. Their forms are younger and less experienced than ours, but their spirits are just as developed as ours. In fact, I believe that we often have children who are spiritually more developed than we are, so that we can learn from them. Our children come into the world as clear beings. They know who they are and what they are here to do. I believe that on some level of consciousness, parents and children have made an agreement. The parents have agreed to support and assist the child in developing his form, body, mind, and emotions, and learning how to operate in the world. The child has agreed to help the parents be more in touch with their intuitive selves. Because children have not yet lost their conscious connection to their spirit, they provide us with considerable support in reconnecting with our own higher selves. Our children essentially need two things from us, one, they need to be recognized for who they really are. If we see and know that they are powerful and sophisticated spiritual beings and relate to them that way from the beginning, they will not need to hide their power and lose touch with their soul, as many of us have. Their being will receive the support and acknowledgement they need to remain clear and strong. Two. They need us to create an example for them of how to live effectively in the world of form. As we do this, they watch how we live and imitate us. Being very perceptive and pragmatic, they copy what we actually do, and not what we say. In return for taking responsibility for these two things, we receive from our children endless amounts of vibrant energy. Unless they are shut down at a very early age through lack of support, Children are very clear and powerful channels. Because they have not yet developed much rational censorship, they are almost totally intuitive, completely spontaneous, and absolutely honest. From watching them, we can learn a great deal about how to follow energy and live creatively. Most parents have not been able to fulfill their responsibilities as successfully as they would have wished. In general, parents have been confused about their roles and responsibilities. They haven't had any clear models or guidelines. Until very recently in human history, no one did much research on parenting, and there are still very few resources for educating oneself about how to be a parent. Most people parent in a rather hit-or-miss fashion. So, everyone has made plenty of mistakes. I've met a lot of parents who, now that they have become more conscious, feel tremendous guilt and sadness in looking back on how they've raised their children. It's helpful to remember that children are powerful, spiritual beings who are responsible for their own lives, they chose you as a parent so that they could learn the things they needed to work out in this lifetime. Also, it helps tremendously to know that as you grow and evolve, they will be positively affected and supported by your transformation. They will change as you change, even if they are grown and live far away from you. All relationships are telepathic, so no matter what the physical distance, 
they will continue to reflect you. Because we have not been sufficiently attuned to our own being, it's been hard to recognize and trust the spirit within our children. Because they were physically undeveloped and rationally unsophisticated, we thought they were less aware and less responsible than they really are. I've observed in many people the underlying attitude that children are somewhat helpless or untrustworthy and that parents are responsible for controlling and molding them into responsible beings. Children, of course, pick up this attitude and reflect it in their behavior. If you recognize and treat them as powerful, spiritually mature, responsible beings, they will respond accordingly. Children as mirrors. Because young children are relatively unspoiled, they are our clearest mirrors. As intuitive beings, they are tuned in on a feeling level and respond honestly to the energy as they feel it. They haven't learned to cover up yet. When adults do not speak or behave according to what they are actually feeling, children pick up the discrepancy immediately and react to it. Watching their reactions can help us become more aware of our own suppressed feelings. For example, if you are trying to appear calm and collected when inside you are feeling upset and angry, your children may mirror this to you by becoming wild and disruptive. You are trying to maintain control, but they pick up the chaotic energy inside of you and reflect it in their behavior. Oddly enough, if you express directly what you are truly feeling without trying to cover it up, I'm feeling really upset and frustrated because I've had a rotten day. I'm mad at the world and at myself and at you. I want you to be quiet so I can have peace and quiet to try to sort out my feelings. Will you please go outside for a few minutes, they will usually calm down. They feel comfortable with the truth and the congruity between your feelings and your words. Many parents think they have to protect their children from their, the parents, confusion or so-called negative feelings. They think that being a good parent means maintaining a certain role, always being patient, loving, wise, and strong. In fact, children need honesty, they need to see a model of a human being going through all the different feelings and moods that a human being goes through and being honest about it. This gives them permission and support to love themselves and allow themselves to be real and truthful. Sharing your feelings with your children does not mean dumping your anger on them or blaming them for your troubles. It also does not mean you can expect them to be your partner or therapist and help you with your problems. The more you practice expressing your feelings honestly as you go along, the less likely you are to do these things. Being human, however, you probably will dump your anger or frustration on them from time to time. Once you see that you've done it, Tell them you realize that you dumped on them and that you are truly sorry, and then let it go. It's all part of learning to be in close relationships. Children also serve as our mirrors by imitating us from a very young age. We are their model for behavior, so they pattern themselves after us. Thus, we can watch them to see what we are doing. Children often reflect either our primary selves, in the ways they are similar to us, or our own disowned selves, in the ways they are different from us. When they behave in ways that we find upsetting or mystifying, they are usually acting out one or more of our disowned selves, our shadow side. For example, a woman friend of mine is a very sweet, loving person who is a committed pacifist. She was shocked and horrified to discover that her little boy loved playing with toy guns, of course, he was reflecting her disowned aggressive side. When your child does something you don't like, tell him or her how you feel about it and deal with it directly, but, also ask yourself in what way that behavior mirrors you or how you might be supporting it in your own process. For example, if your children are being secretive and hiding things from you, ask yourself if you have been really open and honest about all your feelings with them. Is there something you are hiding from someone or from yourself? Is there some way you don't trust yourself and therefore don't trust them? If your children are being rebellious, take a look at the relationship between your own inner authoritarian and rebel. If your inner authoritarian has a lot of control in your life, your children may be acting out your suppressed rebellious side. Or, if you've acted out the rebel a lot in your life, they may be imitating you. 
take a good look at how these problems reflect your inner process. If you learn from your experiences and grow, so will your children. Externally, a lot of these problems can be worked through by deeply and sincerely sharing your feelings and learning to assert yourself, and by encouraging your children to do the same. You may want to get support from a professional counselor or family therapist to help the whole family change its old patterns. I have found that, for many people, parenting has been a convenient excuse not to do their own learning and growing. Frequently, parents spend most of their time focusing on their children, trying to make sure that the children learn and grow properly. In taking responsibility for their children's lives, they abandon responsibility for their own lives. This has the unfortunate result of making the children feel, unconsciously, that they have to take responsibility for their parents, because their parents are sacrificing for them. Children may imitate their parents' behavior by taking responsibility for other people, or they may rebel against the pressure to con, form to their parents' expectations by acting out the opposite of what their parents want. Parents need to shift the focus of their responsibility from their children back to themselves, where it belongs. Remember that children learn by example. They will tend to do what you do, not what you tell them to do. The more you learn to take care of yourself and live a fulfilling, happy life, the more they will do the same. This doesn't mean you should abandon or ignore your children. It doesn't mean that you let them do whatever they want. You are in a deep relationship with them and like any other relationship, it takes a lot of caring and communication. It's important for all of you to express feelings, make needs known, and set clear boundaries. Furthermore, you have accepted certain responsibilities to care for them physically and financially. You have a right to require their co-responsibility and cooperation in that process. The key is in your attitude. If you truly see your children as powerful, responsible entities and treat them as equal to you in spirit, while acknowledging that they are less experienced than you in form, they will mirror that attitude back to you. From the time they are born, assume that they know who they are and what they want, and that they have valid feelings and opinions about everything. Even before they can talk, ask them for their feelings about things they are involved in and trust your intuition and the signals they give you to know what their answers are. For example, ask them if they'd like to be included in an outing or if they'd rather stay home with a babysitter. Trust your feelings about which choice they are making and proceed accordingly. Then pay attention to the signals they give. If you take them on an outing and they cry the whole time, next time try leaving them with the babysitter. As they grow older, continue to include them in family decisions and responsibilities. As much as possible, allow them to make their own decisions about their personal lives. This means they may sometimes have to deal with the consequences of making certain decisions. Offer them your love, support, and advice, but let it be understood that their lives are basically their own responsibility. Be sure you set your own boundaries clearly, what is okay and what isn't. Making their own decisions does not include the right to take advantage of you. Above all, try to communicate your honest feelings to them and ask them to let you know how they are feeling. Almost all family problems arise from lack of communication. Your children certainly aren't going to know how to communicate clearly if you don't know how. It seems to be terribly difficult for parents to give up living their children's lives for them and start living their own. In order to do this, parents have to be willing to admit how dependent they really are on their children and how frightened they feel about letting go of them. These feelings are usually masked by a reverse projection, parents will tell themselves that their children are dependent on them and won't be okay if their parents start focusing on fulfilling their own needs. I have found that this is a false issue. The real issue is the parents' feelings of dependency on their children, which they usually aren't even conscious of. Children are so alive and exciting, parents often secretly fear that their lives will be drab and dull without their children. Or, perhaps they are just afraid to face themselves. Once they recognize and acknowledge these feelings, they will begin to deal with the emptiness within themselves and their lives. They will begin to look at what they want and how they can satisfy themselves. 
they will begin to trust their own gut feelings about things and act on them. At this point, the children really start to flourish. They are finally liberated from the unconscious task of trying to take care of their parents, they are freed to make their own lives worthwhile. The children start doing what they really need to do for themselves. They can now become the channels they truly are. One couple who are close friends of mine have a beautiful daughter. Since before she was born, her parents were aware of her as a powerful being and felt that they were in communication with that being. I was present at her home birth, a wonderful event. A few minutes after she was born, I was holding her and she looked strongly and directly into my eyes, I had previously heard that babies can't focus at such an early age. It was quite apparent to me that she was well aware of what was happening. She has been raised much as I have described. She has always been afforded the respect that she deserved and was treated as a highly conscious entity. As a result, she is a truly remarkable child. Wherever she goes, people remark on her strong presence. It's easy to see that she is an open channel for the universe. Meditation Get comfortable, relax, and close your eyes. Take a few deep breaths and move your awareness into a deep, quiet place within you. Picture or imagine your child in front of you. Look into his or her eyes and sense the powerful being within. Take a little time just to be with this experience and receive any feelings, ideas, or impressions about who your child really is. Communicate to him or her, in your own words, your respect and appreciation. Imagine that your child is communicating to you his or her respect and appreciation. If you have more than one child, do this with each one of them. This meditation is effective in opening the love and communication between you and your children, whether they are infants or adults. Exercise Practice telling the truth to your children and expressing your feelings honestly with them even if you feel vulnerable and uncomfortable about not being in control. Ask them how they feel about things and try to really listen to what they have to say. If you are tempted to give advice, ask them if they want to hear it first. If they don't, tell them your feelings instead. Chapter 17 Work and Play Our culture is obsessed with achievement and productivity. As a result we have an epidemic of workaholism in which most of us push ourselves much harder than is necessary or healthy. We need to learn to relax, nurture ourselves, and have fun. Some people carry the opposite polarity, they know how to relax and play, but have difficulty focusing and working hard enough to accomplish things. When you're following your energy and doing what feels right to you, moment by moment, the distinction between work and play tends to dissolve. Work is no longer what you have to do and play what you want to do. When you are doing what you love, you may work harder and produce more than ever before, but you will experience such enjoyment and pleasure in your work that at times it may feel like play. Each one of us has a true purpose and each one of us is a unique channel for the universe. We make a contribution to the world just by being ourselves every moment. There need not be rigid categories in our lives, this is work, this is play. It all blends into the flow of following the universe, and money flows in as a result of the open channel that's created. Work is no longer something you have to do in order to survive and sustain life. You no longer work just for the sake of making money. Instead, the delight that comes from expressing yourself becomes the greatest reward. The money comes along as a natural part of being alive. For some, working and getting money may no longer even be directly related to each other, you may experience that you are doing whatever you have the energy to do and that money is coming into your life. It's no longer a matter of, you do this and then you get money for it. The two things are simply operating simultaneously in your life but not necessarily in a direct cause and effect relationship. In the new world, it's difficult to pin life's work and true purpose down to any one thing. In terms of looking for a career, our old world concept told us that when we became adults, we had to decide what our career would be and then pursue an education or other steps to achieve that career. The career would then be pursued for most, or all, of our life. 
In the new world, many of us are channels for a number of things that may come together in fascinating combinations. Perhaps you haven't found your career because it doesn't exist yet. Your particular and unique way of expressing yourself has never existed before and will never be repeated again. As you practice following the energy in your life, it may lead you in many directions. You may express yourself in a variety of areas, all of which will begin to synthesize in some surprising, interesting, and very new, creative way. You will no longer be able to say, I'm a writer, or a fireman or a teacher or a housewife. You may be a combination of all of those things. You'll be doing what you love, what you're good at, what comes easily to you and has an element of challenge and excitement to it. Whatever you do will feel satisfying and fulfilling to you. It will no longer be a matter of doing things now for later gratification, I will work hard now so that I can get a better job later. I will work hard now so that I can retire and enjoy my life. I will work hard now in order to have enough money and time to have a vacation where I can have fun. It's the fulfillment of what you're doing at this very moment that counts. In being a channel, everything you do becomes a contribution, even the simplest things are significant. It is the energy of the universe moving through us that transforms, not just the specific things we do. When I write a book that has a certain impact on a reader's life, it's because of the energy of the universe that comes through me and connects to the reader's deeper levels of awareness. The words and ideas are the icing on the cake. They are the things that enable our minds to grasp what has already been changed. It is not so important that I wrote a book. What is important is that I expressed myself, opened up, and allowed the creative energy to flow through me. That creative energy is now penetrating other people and things in this world. I had the joy of that energy moving through me and other people had the joy of receiving that energy. That's the transformational experience. Whether you are washing the dishes, taking a walk, or building a house, if you're doing it with a sense of being right where you want to be and doing what you want to be doing, that fullness and joy in the experience will be felt by everyone around you. If you're building a house and somebody walks by and sees you doing it, they will feel the impact of the fullness of your experience. Their lives will be transformed to the degree that they are ready to allow the energy's impact. Though they may not know what hit them, they will start to experience life differently. It's the same when you're just being. If you walk into a room, feeling whole, and expressing yourself in whatever way feels right to you, then every one in the room will be affected and catalyzed in their own growth process. Even though they may not recognize it or know anything about it consciously, you may at times be able to see the direct result of your channel operating. You will see proof of it in watching the changes in people. It is an incredibly exciting and satisfying experience. You can see that it may no longer be an issue of focusing on one lifelong career. At times in your life, you may be led to focus and build structure in one particular area of knowledge or expertise. You may choose to learn certain skills that you will use to allow your channel to function in a way that it wants to function. If you do this, you will be led through the learning experience easily and naturally. The process of learning will be just as satisfying as the doing. In other words, it is no longer necessary to sacrifice in the moment so that in the future you will be able to have what you want. The learning process can be fun, joyful, and exciting. You'll experience it as being exactly what you want to be doing at that time. Practicing, learning skills, going to school, all of this can be fun and fulfilling when you are following your intuitive guidance. The work you do as a result will also be a learning experience. For example, I teach workshops, not because I've mastered the information and I am the expert, but because I love to share myself in this way. This sharing deepens my learning experience. Again, there is no strong boundary between learning and teaching, just as there is no wall between work and play. It all begins to blend and weave into one integrated and balanced experience. Most people do have some sense, at least deep inside, 
of what they would love to be doing. This feeling is often so repressed, however, that it is experienced only in the form of some wildly impractical fantasy, something you could never do. I always encourage people to get in touch with these fantasies. Observe and explore thoroughly your most incredible fantasy of how you'd like to be and what you'd like to be doing. There is truth in this desire. Even if it seems impossible, there is at least a grain of truth in the image. It is telling you something about some part of you that's wanting to be expressed. Your fantasies can tell you a great deal about yourself. Many times, I've found that people have a strong sense of what they would like to do, yet they take up a career that is very different from their desire. Sometimes they go for the opposite because they feel it is practical or will gain the approval of their parents or the world. They figure it is impossible to do what they really want, so they might as well settle for something else that comes along. I encourage people to risk exploring the things that really turn them on. The following are examples of people I've worked with and their exploration of their true purpose. 1. A brilliant and talented woman I know had been working with sick and dying people for many years. Although she was a great nurse and a powerful healer, it became evident to her that she needed to be where she could express herself more creatively. With encouragement, she started working fewer days as a nurse and began leading workshops and counseling people. Because she's doing this, she feels more fulfilled and those around her feel her fulfillment, as well. 2. Joseph was a young man in his early twenties. Following family tradition, he went into business with his father and brothers. He was very successful in real estate and contracting. The problem was, he knew there was something else he wanted to do with his life. After lots of encouragement from the group in one of my work shops, he admitted that he wanted to work in the arts, but knew his family would frown on it. He most wanted to be a dancer. The first step was admitting to himself what he wanted to do. Eventually, he mustered the courage to take dance classes. He had a lot of talent and immediately attracted the attention of the teacher. He continued to explore this form of artistic expression. When he supported his desires, he actually found that his family was equally supportive. 3. A close friend of mine had three children, no college education, and was living on welfare. Her desire was to get into business. She intuitively felt she was going to handle large amounts of money, but considering her situation, this didn't make sense. Nevertheless, she decided to explore some possibilities in the financial district of San Francisco. She was immediately hired as a receptionist, she went on to be an administrative assistant and continued to rise to higher levels of skill and responsibility. She eventually reached her goal of being a stockbroker. She loves what she's doing and her children are flourishing as well. 4. A woman who came to a recent workshop of mine shared that she'd been a talented pianist with hopes of becoming a con, cert pianist. Then, for several reasons, the most predominant being a lack of faith in herself, she had given up her dream. She started working in an office and found that between work and her children, she had little time for her music. After 15 years, she felt it was simply too late to ever go back to the piano. She felt the time she had lost in not playing rendered hopeless any chance of being great. Despite all her doubts, we encouraged her to at least start playing again. I assured her that if she was doing what she loved, it would come back to her easily. As she opened to this idea, she started opening to herself. Her sense of hopelessness was replaced by a renewed sense of power. She called later to say she had been playing the piano and feeling great about it. A friend had asked her to play accompaniment for a choral group and she was feeling very excited about the musical possibilities starting to happen for her. Meditation Sit or lie down in a comfortable position. Close your eyes and relax. Take several slow, deep breaths, relaxing your body more deeply with each breath. Take several more breaths and relax your mind. Release and relax all the tension in your body. If you want, 
imagine that your body is almost sinking into the floor, bed, or chair. From this very relaxed place inside, imagine that you are doing exactly what you want in your life. You have a fabulous career that is fun and fulfilling for you. You are now doing what you've always fantasized about and getting well paid for it. You feel relaxed, energized, creative, and powerful. You are successful at what you do because it is exactly what you want to be doing. You follow your intuition moment to moment and are richly rewarded for it. Exercises 1. Follow any impulses you have in the direction of your true work slash play slash creative desires. Even if it seems totally unrealistic, follow the impulse anyway. For example, if you're 65 years old and have always wanted to be a ballet dancer, go to a ballet class and observe, or, if you want, take a beginning class. Watch some ballet and imagine that you're a dancer. While alone at home, put on some music and dance. This will get you in touch with the part of yourself that wants to be expressed that way. You may end up dancing much more than you thought possible, and you may be led to other forms of expression that will feel as good. 2. List any fantasies you've had around work, career, or creativity, and beside that, list the action you plan to take to explore this. 3. Write an ideal scene, a description of your perfect job or career exactly as you would like it to be. Write it in the present tense, as if it were already true. Put in enough description and details to make it seem very real. Put it away somewhere, and look at it again in a few months or even a year or two. Unless your fantasy has changed completely in that time, chances are that you will find you have made significant progress in the direction of your dream. Chapter 18 Money Money is a symbol of our creative energy. We have invented a system whereby we use pieces of paper or metal to represent a certain unit of creative energy. For example, you earn money by using your energy, then you trade that money to me in exchange for the energy I put into writing this book or leading a workshop, and so forth. Because the creative energy of the universe in all of us is limitless and readily available, so, potentially, is money. When we follow our inner guidance and move with the flow of energy in our lives, we find we have enough money to do the things we truly need and want to do. A shortage of money often mirrors the fact that our energy is blocked in other ways. Your ability to earn and spend money abundantly and wisely is based on your ability to be a channel for the universe. The stronger and more open your channel is, the more will flow through it. The more you are willing to trust yourself, and take the risks to follow your inner guidance, the more likely you are to have all the money you need. The universe will pay you to be yourself and do what you really love. Money in the Old World The old world is based on our attachment to the external, physical world. We look for satisfaction from external things. Because we believe that survival depends on getting things, we may think that fulfillment can be found in material wealth. In the old world, you can build a strong financial structure and earn lots of money by learning how to act effectively in the world, the old male energy. However, because your actions are not based on the guidance of the universe that comes from the inner female, building your financial structure will often involve fear, competition, and struggle, and you will pay a high price for the money. You can earn money, but find that you are ruled by it. You think the money itself is important. If I have enough money, I can do these things and then I'll be happy, or if I have enough money, then I'll feel good about myself and I'll be happy, or other people will like me if I have enough money and that will make me happy. From this point of view money is seen to be the important thing, but as long as it is valued in this way, money is always a problem. If you have too little money, you're always struggling to get more money and always afraid there won't be enough. There's always that terrible pain inside that you don't have enough of what you need. On the other hand, from this perspective, even if you have a lot of money, it's painful because you're always afraid you're going to lose it. You can never have enough money to ensure that you won't be afraid. People with little money seldom realize that people who have a lot of money are also frightened. They are basically insecure because they never know if they might lose their money. 
circumstances out of their control might arise, they might make a foolish investment or somebody might steal their money. If security is based on having money, it doesn't matter whether you have a little or a lot, you're going to be afraid. If we don't realize that money is a symbol of infinite energy, and we think there is only a limited amount of it in the world, we're stuck with two options, we can choose to have a lot of money and feel guilty, or we can choose to do without and resent those who have more. If you chose to have money, you will live with the knowledge that others have less than you. You may fear that your having more causes others to have less. You may choose to deal with the guilt by trying to deny or ignore the feeling, or you may choose to ease your conscience by attempting to help those who are less fortunate. On the other hand, you can choose to say, I won't carry that guilt. I won't take more than my share. I don't care about money anyway. Therefore, I will keep what I have to a minimum. I'll make sure that I am not taking from somebody else. The problem with this attitude is that you may end up feeling deprived. You see all the beautiful, wonderful things in the world that you would like to have and enjoy, but you can't. You see other people who have more than their share of money and you resent them. Basically, in this old world framework, we must choose either guilt or resentment. The old world structure demands we do things out of our individual strength, instead of allowing the universe to do it. We think we have to work really hard to get what we want, the work ethic that says, work hard. Sacrifice and struggle. Most of us have that so deeply embedded in us that we don't allow ourselves to succeed financially or in any other way, except through hard work, struggle, and sacrifice. If you are succeeding in making money, you are also paying a price emotionally, and often physically. People frequently drive themselves to the point of sickness or death. They struggle and sacrifice emotionally, and in the end, even though they have achieved worldly success, they still feel deprived and empty. Or, people refuse to go after it at all. Look what it leads to, struggle, sacrifice, pain, and deprivation of oneself, so I simply won't deal with it. I'll get by on the absolute minimum amount of money in my own life. Often, more sensitive, spiritually inclined people choose this route so they can focus on more meaningful things. The problem with this is you're actually depriving yourself of dealing with one of the most exciting and beautiful things in life. If you're denying money, you're also denying a big part of the energy of the universe and the way the world works. People who choose the denial route usually don't know how to handle money and refuse to learn anything about it. Money in the New World The New World is based on trust of the universe within us. We recognize that the creative intelligence and energy of the universe is the fundamental source of everything. Once we connect with this and surrender to it, everything is ours. Emptiness is filled from the inside. We realize that money is a reflection of the energy moving through our channel. The more we learn to operate in the world based on trust in our intuition, the stronger our channel will be and the more money we are likely to have. The money in our life is based on our ability to listen to our inner guidance and risk acting on it. When you let go of trying to control and you learn how to listen to the universe and act on it, money increasingly comes into your life. It flows in an easy, effortless, and joyful way because there is no sacrifice involved. You're no longer attached to it. Instead, you can experience the joy of learning how to follow the energy of the universe. Money is an extra bonus in the process. You know that the money is not really yours, it belongs to the universe. You act as a caretaker or steward for the money. You use it only as you are directed by the universe through your own intuition. There is no fear of loss because you know you are always taken care of. The money may come or go, but you can't lose the joy and fulfillment in your life. When you feel this secure and free, you often attract more and more money, so that you are continually pushed to deepen your trust at more intense levels with higher stakes. Ultimately, as channels, many of us will be called upon to handle large amounts of money from this place of surrender and commitment to the higher power. 
This is one of the ways that the power of the universe can be wielded effectively to transform the world. Active and Receptive There are active and receptive aspects of the process of channeling money, as in every other creative process. The masculine or active way of making money is to go out after something. You see something you want and go for it. The feminine or receptive way of making money is to attract what you want to you. We have to be able to do both. We need to release the outgoing energy that wants to move toward a certain goal and risk fearlessly acting on it. We also need to practice nurturing ourselves, appreciating ourselves, and becoming attuned to our inner selves so that we can attract and receive what we want. Many people are developed on one side or the other. They either know how to go after things, but have a hard time attracting things to them, or they know how to attract things but are afraid to go out after them. Often a balancing process is necessary. You may need to learn to receive the gifts, appreciation, love, and energy coming to you. Or you may need to practice outflowing your energy into the world, which keeps it flowing through your channel. This way, the energy doesn't get blocked on either end. This means, on a practical level, you have to be willing to take some risks in the area of work and money. If you do only what you think you should do in order to make money and be secure, then you won't listen to the intuitive voice that tells you what you really need to do. This can be very scary when it entails your job and your money. People often want to know, what do I do if my intuition tells me not to go to work one day? What do I do then? Will I lose my job? If taking off a day from work seems too risky, it may not be the best choice for you yet. You may need to strengthen your channel by following your impulses in smaller ways at first. You may call in and take half a day off or you may plan for a three-day weekend. One day though, you may wake up and know, I just don't want to go to work, and you will follow through with this and feel good about it. Usually, when my insides tell me to take time off, I need some nurturing, some peace and quiet, some creative time for inspiration to come through, or time to simply feel old feelings stirring up inside, feelings that need to be felt and released. If you risk following your impulse, you'll find, maybe a few hours or days later, your energy will actually be renewed. You'll be able to go back and do what needs to be done in a fourth of the time. You'll do it in a much more inspired and creative way. Anything can happen if you risk and trust yourself. While home, you may receive a phone call from a person offering you a better job that pays much more money, that happened to a friend of mine. You may get a creative inspiration that will open up a fun, prosperous opportunity for you or you may get an inspiration to go visit someone who will give you a lead to a great adventure. If you hate your job, though, your energy for it won't come back. Also, because your true creative energy is blocked, you'll continue to feel blocked financially. Eventually, you will probably leave your job because you cannot stay stuck in such a place for long. Basically, the whole issue of money is doing what you really want to do as much of the time as possible. The universe will reward you for taking risks on its behalf. It's important, though, that the risks you take are proportionate to the level of structure you're building. In other words, if you're just beginning to learn how to trust and follow your intuition, you probably don't want to make a million-dollar deal on a gut feeling. You probably don't want to leap off a building and hope that you can fly. It is important that you build small things first. Practice following your intuition in everyday things. Say no, even though you're feeling pressured to say yes. Do the thing you want to do even though you don't know why. Do it on an impulse. Make that call. Enroll in that class. Think of the things you love to do, and do them. This will strengthen you to the point where you can make the big leaps. Balance. Once you understand the basic process of learning how to follow your intuition and act on it, you have your groundwork for channeling money. There are, though, some aspects of relating more specifically to money that are important to know. Balance is an important quality to develop in building the structure of your channel. If you have been extreme in one direction, 
you may have to go to the extreme in the other direction in order to integrate and balance both aspects of everything. For example, if you have been very careless and casual about money, or if you have been a person who has denied the existence or importance of money in your life, you may need to build structures specifically related to money. These include, learning to balance your checkbook, budgeting money, and gaining an understanding of the rules that govern how money works in the world. You will find these practices interesting, even fascinating. They are no longer something that will block you from the spirit, they will open the way for you to have more spirit flowing through you. People who have little understanding of money have usually chosen to avoid structure on one level or another because they feel rules, regulations, and details will keep them from experiencing the magic of life. They're afraid they'll spend all their time in their rational mind, instead of following their flow. If you have this fear, tune in and ask the universe for guidance. You'll want to do this in a way that makes you feel good. Perhaps it would help to hire someone to show you how to organize your finances. It does not have to be a painful process. You'll find it to be energizing and supportive in your life, as opposed to painful and boring. Those who have already applied a great deal of structure to working with money in the world may need to let go and relax that structure. It's time to stop following your rules and allow the inspired aspect of the spirit of money to work in your life. Trust your intuition to guide you, and take more risks in doing things differently than usual. Similarly, if you've been a person who has saved your money and been very careful about spending it, you need to learn to spend more impulsively based on your intuition. Spend on the basis of a gut feeling of wanting something. Learn to follow these impulses and you'll find you won't end up broke. In fact, it actually creates a greater flow of money in your life. You're able to release and give it out, based on your intuition. If you have been a spendthrift and always spent more than you actually have, you will probably need to plan more and budget. Again, do it in accordance with an inner feeling. If you're open to it, your intuition will tell you, hey, learn something about planning. Learn something about budgeting. It will support and help you. It won't make you feel restricted. If you follow your intuition about this, you will be led to people who can show you how to do it, and it will be an interesting process. Again, it will support your channel. 